Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the OK Grognard Show. It is Tuesday, December 15th, 2020, 10 a.m. Central, in beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Well, it's Tuesday. Cartography and World Building Day. We're going to focus on some world building today. Looking at a section in the first edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeon Master's Guide on Non-Standard Magic Items. Yeah, good old DMG. It's uh, it's not a huge section. It's really a smallish section in the middle of the uh, Fabrication of Magic Items section. Um, I don't want to go into that in a regular sized show, so we'll save that one until we have the beefier shows in the new year, rather than bust it up in the parts. But I did want to look at this one section in isolation, because I think there's some interesting things about it. This may not, uh, may not take a full show, but we'll see. So... Non-standard magic items. There are two considerations respecting non-standard magic items. The first is your invention and inclusion of them in your campaign. And this is expected and encouraged. I think in this case, we're looking at campaign as campaign world rather than a game you're running for a specific group of players. We're looking at setting here, so hence the uh, reason to do this on a world-building day rather than a campaign discussion day, just to clarify the use of that term, which, uh, again, we're, we're back into uh, reasons why in the new year a lot of this stuff will be brought together on a single day, so we don't have to worry about the uh, many permutations of some of these terms and try to divvy them out onto days that are campaign-oriented or world-building-oriented or adventure-building-oriented. Anyway, to continue, you should put your imagination and inventiveness to work this way on non-standard magic items. Standard items can be varied, so as to make it more interesting when your players are familiar with the usual forms, new devices can be created to add freshness and new dimensions to the game. Special magic items can be devised to complement some special situation or to serve as a special reward for overcoming some special monster or difficult area. So let's... Uh, Let's uh, pick apart some of this, not in a bad way, but standard items can be varied so as to make it more interesting for your players familiar with the usual forms. So, long swords are kind of the uh, the benchmark of of uh, D and D weaponry for the fighter the long sword is sort of the staple <laughs> hey how's it going rick rick says beautiful lake geneva 16 degrees out ha 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 all right pal i gotcha there's nothing to say that it can't be beautiful and cold kind of like galadriel all right i think we're uh you got to make me nerd out here with a little Lord of the Rings referencing to uh, make it all okay. Which way are we going here? I want to go this way. Let's move me over into the center here. Anyway, 16 degrees is not bad. It's those uh, minus degrees with heavy winds and super wind chills that really start to get a... that really frost my ass, as it were. Anyway. <laughs> As I was picking this apart, 
New devices can be created to add freshness and new dimensions to the game. So anytime you introduce something to a group of players that have played the game for a while, anytime you introduce something to them that they haven't seen in a book that they've secretly read because they don't want you to know they've memorized the monster manual and the dungeon master guys cover to cover, even though they will never run a game. <laughs> I'm not saying they shouldn't. I'm not saying they shouldn't aspire to run games. I'm saying that the vast majority of players just simply won't run games. They don't uh, fancy themselves uh, officiates. They don't they don't want the uh, extra work. They'll pretend like it's not that much work because they don't want you getting any credit if you're a DM for doing all that extra work. But ask them to step up and run one, and uh, it's pretty pretty rare, pretty rare. I would uh, I would guess that one in three players ever runs a game at all. One in four players might run a bunch of games, one shots and stuff. And uh, maybe one in five or less will run a whole campaign, a series of adventures with the same player characters, either in a linear story sort of format or a, or a, a sandbox, which is probably even more rare. So when they say new devices can be created to add freshness and new dimensions to your game, it's largely because they've seen everything in the book, even if you haven't used it in the games you've played with them. So adding anything new, just taking any kind of random item, uh, a teapot, and imbuing it with some sort of power, some sort of magic. It, uh, if you make tea in it, you can pour three healing potions out of it in a day. What a great idea, right? Yeah, I make you nerd out. You do. I always nerd out when you're around, Rick, for sure. No doubt about it. That's uh, that's part of the fun of uh, being a lifelong gamer, right, is nerding out unabashedly. Special magic items, and this is this is even more fun, this sentence here. Special magic items can be devised to complement some special situation or to serve as a special reward for overcoming some special, three specials, monster or difficult area. Special magic items can be devised. So, <clears throat> let's say you create this complex, nerd merchant. Yeah, that's me. I'm an NPC nerd merchant. I'm not even a player character. I'm just an NPC. When you come in and when you come into the store, do you see like a glowing question mark floating over my head, knowing that then that you can ask me questions, and I would send you on a quest in to play a game of magic in the back room to do a draft. Anywho, the uh, special, special, special sentence suggests that uh, this isn't to say that something can only be set up for one campaign. You can set up something that you plunk down in your sandbox setting that can be found someday that has all sorts of special things about it. A special monster, a difficult area. You create a monster that can only be killed by a certain weapon. And then you create that weapon, that special magical weapon, and put it somewhere where it has to be retrieved to be able to take care of the monster and thereby create a special situation by marrying the two together as a, uh, as a uh, difficulty that uh, can only be overcome one way. Now, you better put a really cool treasure in there beyond that special weapon because, well, you know, the weapon might be the only thing that can destroy that one monster, but that is not to say that that special weapon can only destroy that one monster. It can be a plus two scimitar of uh, monster slaying with plus four against this one specific creature. 
that may be, may be really, really tough otherwise. So we shouldn't say that this monster can be only taken this one way. You don't want to box yourself in to creating just one single key to any given door, metaphorically speaking. If you don't uh, keep things broad enough that multiple solutions can be brought to the table, you're compromising uh, the ability of the uh, group to come up with interesting new ways to surprise you and to uh, solve problems on the fly that uh, maybe you didn't think of. Maybe that's going to be the best thing ever for the game. Whatever. Whether it's uh, creating a portal that drops it into a vat of acid in another plane. Where'd that come from? I don't know, my players figured it out, and that's what they did, and going to have to rule it worked. So maybe they didn't need the weapon. Maybe the weapon then just becomes part of the treasure that they eventually find. So creating special situations are, are, are really a great idea with special items and special monsters, but don't box yourself into making them um, a dead end. There's only one way to get there, and there's only one way to do it. And if you don't figure that out, you're done for. Because it wouldn't be terrible to run up against a monster and you haven't found this sword, and it's the only thing that can hurt it. And suddenly the monster's just wiping out every one of you. And then you roll up new characters, and you get them high enough level to take another stab at this monster, so to speak. And you go back there, but you still haven't figured out that you need this one weapon. Somehow that has never become apparent. And now uh, your next group is totally wiped out because you can't harm this thing except with that one weapon. So that's what I'm saying about boxing yourself in. At some point, that's going to cease to be fun. It might seem interesting at first. I'll tell you what, when they're on their, assuming they have this kind of stick to it when they're on their 10th group of characters and they finally figure out that they need that sword if this was the situation you created, and they go and get that sword and they kill that monster, and you explain, yeah, you needed that sword the whole time. Sorry about all those characters you rolled up and died. <laughs> I would not be surprised if they uh, beat you within an inch of your life with your own DMG, so watch out for that. That's when a special weapon hits a special, special kind of monster. <sighs> All right, let's continue. All such creations, however, must be made with care. Well, we just talked about that. The items must be such as to not unbalance the game. True, too. You don't want to make something that's too crazy powerful for uh, for your setting in total. Every time you swing a sword, it sets off a nuclear blast what's what's that going to do for your game that's not going to be fun they must not make one player character too strong either with respect to opponents or his or her fellows or to the campaign or to the game system as a whole so uh, they do mention what would happen in a particular campaign when it comes to other player characters in there but the rest of this advice is all good world building advice you put something out there, if you put something out there that's guarded by creatures or uh, traps or whatever that uh, is balanced toward people of a level who could overcome those things, then uh, chances are you're pretty safe. It's probably, unless it has some one single ability that is beyond all of that, um, you're probably pretty safe putting it in there and not have to worry about it being uh, overpowered for your entire game world or for the setting um, or for the system, I should say. Uh, game system as a whole. Items which are expended after one after a single use, those with limited usages, and those with variable effects are most desirable. Absolutely true. Potions, one and done. You don't have to worry about that again. 
if it was a little more powerful than the situation demanded, it ain't going to be there that long. So let ride it out. Let it happen. If there are uh, items with um, with uh, charges like uh, wands and whatnot, if those are, you throw in there and those are a little too powerful, well, you do know there's light at the end of the tunnel. The number of charges is going to tell you how long that tunnel is. But uh, there are ways of uh, draining weapons. You can put some sort of a... Uh, and this is true for non-charged items too. Like uh, some sort of annihilating a rod of a... Uh, you know, uh, is it annihilation? What's the one that sucks magic out of another item? I was just looking at one of those the other day, but I can't think of the name right now. Anyway, if only I had like a Dungeon Master's Guide or something. I'll let one of you look it up and let me know. But at the end of the day, I know it's a rod and it can take the magic out of an item. That can be used on something with charges or it can be used on a uh, just a regular magic item that's overpowering your campaign. You've given too much and now you're taking it back. There you go. Maybe they'll be upset. Oh, no, we're taking stuff away. You're nerfing my stuff. Well, you know what? I shouldn't have given you that in the first place. So just be glad it, you had it for a little while. A taste of power. Now you have something to aspire to for later in the campaign. And uh, there's nothing to say that there can't be a rod that sucks some magic, not all, out of something. Maybe it cuts the charges of a wand or some other item with charges. Maybe it cuts those number of charges in half. Maybe it draws 25% with each strike. Maybe once they realize that something's going on there, if they can prevent it, they can preserve some of the charges for the item. So, you know, pick and choose how you want to uh, do it. <clears throat> it's certainly more interesting to do it uh, by inches than to do it all or nothing uh, in that it's kind of like giving them a certain amount of fair warning. Rod of cancellation, thank you so much. Good job. I knew somebody somebody would remember. So what about a rod of, and here's you're creating yet another item, a rod of uh, partial cancellation, right? Of uh, and make it obvious too. So you got some guy swinging a rod of cancellation, and he strikes you, and you see the rod glow and the wand you're carrying glow, and you see the the glow on your wand dim. And you can even you know uh, dim to about seventy five percent of how bright it was glowing before if they make like a wisdom check they can kind of gauge how much magic is being sucked out of their their wand of fireballs or whatever so you can do that sort of thing and uh, uh, throw it down it's like giving them fair warning you're not just full on taking something away you're giving them a chance to defend it before it uh, all goes south on them right um, to continue then, in respect to opponents, as a game system as a whole, uh, most desirable, right, with the limited usages, as it is very likely that every campaign will have its special items, the second, situ uh, the second consideration comes up. Yeah, yeah, the idea of, um, you definitely want to uh, keep an eye on uh, items that can have variable effects. Um, there are a lot of games, editions, and other games where they tie an item to the person who picks it up or uses it um, at a certain what if uh, what if I get myself a uh, an amulet that can cast fireballs, and even though I'm only first level, 
Well, it casts a little tiny fireball. It does 1d6 per two levels starting at first level. So, in essence, when I'm fifth level, it can cast a three die fireball. Or maybe it's one per level. So, every level I go up, I can uh, cast uh, an extra d6 on whatever fireballs I cast out of it. Now, maybe it can only do it once a day. Or twice or three times a day. Um, largely depends on how deadly your campaigns are. Will uh, having it more than once a day present a situation where every game your players are in becomes a, uh, well, let's just use up the amulet and then get out of here and go rest and then come back the next day. That's going to get boring for them as well as you pretty fast. So be careful about the uh, number of usages. Maybe it is a number of charges. Maybe it's got 50 charges in it. At first level, it can only do 1d6. At second level, it can do 2d6. But now, at second level, it actually uses two of the charges. So you can decide, do I want two 1d6 fireballs in the day? Or do I want... to? one 2d6 fireball but i only get one of them if i use it all at once right so third it uses three fourth it uses four so it graduates with the player character the power of the player character and uh and yet can be of limited use but still variable so you can break it up i'm gonna say i'm a fourth level caster uh, magic user i can use a 1d6 fireball in this situation and use a 3d6 fireball in that situation now i've used my four for the day that's no good anymore but i've been able to uh, uh, adjust it in certain ways to be more specific to situations kind of makes sense right all right well to continue other referees will not generally know what special powers or restrictions such items have. Thus, they will not be usable in campaigns other than that from which they came in most cases. Uh, there's an interesting thing. Back in the day, and much like Adventurers League now, if you, are, uh, if you created characters, uh, it was kind of acceptable for you to take your characters from any given game and use them with, under other dungeon masters in other games so uh as long as the level and they'd you know they, you'd say well can i bring this character in uh, we're, we're playing tonight okay can i bring this character in from joe's game over there rick's running this really cool game and this character is what i use in his campaign and uh they'd look it over and they'd say yeah you know this won't be this will fit with the group that i'm running tonight now, if that character dies in another campaign, he's dead. You can't bring him back over to Rick's game and let him play over there because uh, he died in Jim's game or whatever, you know. So, so it goes. You gotta, you get that flexibility with where you can play the character, but you still have to uh, accept the fate as it happens. You, as a referee, should simply cause any such items brought into your campaign to disappear. Never take a player's word for any item. <laughs> yeah. Do not allow its use in your campaign unless you know his or her DM and get a full explanation in writing from that person which details the properties of that item. Do not allow a player to bulldoze you in any manner regarding this. Simply inform the person that he or she must have left the item in his or her former area as it is not around in yours exclamation point this solves the problem problem of having a possible imbalance brought into your carefully designed campaign this ties directly to the section dealing with integration of experienced or new players into an existing campaign note altered form of standard of a standard ad and d item is not a new or standard item a cap which causes its wearer to be invisible is the same as a ring of invisibility. Okay, fair enough. Um, that doesn't mean it isn't something you should do, that last bit. 
So this whole section of uh, being careful about letting stuff in your game, I think he writes a whole paragraph on it because he wants to emphasize the point without using all caps, but you get the idea. He's just being a little over, overly protective of uh, his uh, gamers' campaigns. But the, uh, the note about uh, something not being a non-standard item... I don't know that that's necessarily true. Non-standard. Maybe this was in in. Uh, maybe this was in answer to uh, a lot of submissions they were getting for Strategic Review or Dragon Magazine when they. Here's a here's an idea. Here's an idea for a new item. It's a cap that makes you invisible. Okay. It's. Don't send that to us. It's not creative. It's not new. It's just changing the type of clothing from a cloak of invisibility to a cap of invisibility or a ring of invisibility to a cap. So maybe they were getting a lot of that, and that's kind of a response to that. It's a note. It may have been written by an editor. It may have been thrown in there by Tim or... Somebody else who at the time was seeing a lot of that happen and people being very excited that they had created something new. Sup? Hmm. Created five minutes ago. What are the odds? Hmm, interesting. Alrighty, well, we'll take care of that. Done and done. Anyway, thank you very much for coming out today. I do appreciate everybody who follows the show. I appreciate also when you chime into the stream chat and I've got you on the list for this final week. We are in uh, week 37, last week of the year. This will be the last world-building show of the year. So, that's fun. And, also, I do want to say, have a good week. And if you don't make it back before next Monday, which will be the last show of the year, do have a very... Happy holiday. I think some people are already into Hanukkah. Christmas is on the horizon. We'll have the New Year's Eve before I get back. Kwanzaa, whatever you celebrate, have a good one. And know that I appreciate very much that you're joining in on the show. So, for Tuesday, December 15th, 2020... From beautiful yet chilly Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Remember, tomorrow, 10 a.m., we'll have campaign discussion and Thursday, GMing tips. Friday, building adventures. GM reviews on Saturday. Rules retrospective on Sunday. And then the final weekly news and announcements next Monday, the 21st. Final one for the year. If you're catching up with this on YouTube, thank you very much. Do subscribe to the channel. Make sure you give us a thumbs up on any videos you watch that you enjoy. We'll appreciate that. And feel free to make comments if you have some constructive criticism, just want to give us a pat on the back. Or maybe you've got something to chime in that's on theme. All that's good and we appreciate it. I want to say thanks to everybody from the OK Grognard Show in beautiful Lake Geneva. Bye-bye.